Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Osorio. I also go by Michelle Kenobi on the interwebs. And I was a YouTuber who started in filmmaking, got into YouTube. I was in the YouTube space, LA program. For a couple years, I still am. And then something happened. I was living in Boston for a few months, not that long ago, just last year. And I tried VR in its current iteration for the first time, virtual reality. So Boston VR Meetup has since become one of the top five VR Meetups in the world, meaning the most members. So it's huge. And when you show up, developers from all around the world come. It's like a monthly fair. And they have developed games or experiences or apps with virtual reality that you can watch on a headset or something you can interact with. And then they just ask people to try it. Uh, it's a really exciting time. I tried, the very first thing I tried was called Symmetry, which is something still in open beta, and I've since become friends with uh, the person that has created it. I put it on, and I'm watching a music video. I'm inside this pastoral, beautiful area at sunset, and I can con kind of control the environment. I, I can make a butterfly fly around and there's this really nice music. So when I'm done, he tells me it was a music video that somebody locally had made, and they used this thing he, that he created called Symmetry to, to put it together. They created it without having to know any programming. And that was the idea behind Symmetry. After that, I tried some games. I tried uh, Verzoom, which has since been on the Today Show. It's a little bike <laughs> riding game VR experience. But I'm really grateful that Symmetry was my first experience, and the reason is, as a creative person, the very first thing I tried told me this was something I could be a part of, because I became very excited after trying VR. And so to have somebody tell me from the very beginning, this is something you can be a content creator for. We need content creators. We're working on easier ways for you to become a content creator without having a long background in being a developer or a programmer or a game developer or designer, that was big. And since then, I have created a lot of content, but my theme tends to be, you can do this too, and we need you to do this too, because you're the key for VR to succeed. So a lot of people who talk about VR, they, just, they talk a lot about the technology. I talk more about the storytelling part, because there's plenty of people who are figuring out the technology hardware part. As a creative person, as somebody who's more of an artist with a technical leaning, I feel like it's my job right now, and hopefully I'll get more people in this army, is to create the VR version of the cinematic language, which does not exist yet. And so that is my passion and my goal right now, and what I hope to share with you. So if you go to a VR meetup, and you should go to Will's Utah VR Meetup, which is awesome. I've been helping him organize that a little bit. If you go to meetup.com, you can go demo VR experiences. But aside from the technical part, which is very challenging, people are trying to figure out how do you tell stories? What do you do with this? Is it just like a game? Is it just like a movie? Well, we're starting to realize it's kind of something in between, and we haven't come up with a name for it yet. And it'll take a while. We're starting to develop some buzzwords and some terminology, but if you've studied film at all, you know that in the very beginning there were a lot of people who were playing around with film. They didn't know what to do with it. And so they just filmed plays. People literally just set the camera down and then they kind of just danced in front of it and did something like you would do in a play, a dance or a, you know, some kind of play where there wouldn't be any cuts. And then over time, we, we started to understand what you could do with that format and, and what humans could understand. Oh, if you do a cut, people will understand that the baby and then the man's face means the man's looking at the baby. And that's where we are right now with VR. We don't know, there are no answers. And that's scary for some people, but for I'm hoping as some of you start learning about VR, some of you will start to get excited that we don't know the answers, because that means we get to figure them out ourselves. That also means you don't get to Google things or buy a book. The only way to figure out, will this make somebody sick? Will this make somebody cry? Will this make somebody scared? The only way to know is to do it. And that's what I've been doing since. So after I tried those first demos, I started going to the VR meetups every month, 
I couldn't sleep for maybe two weeks, and that's a very common story you'll hear people say who got into the VR industry. Once that bug hits, a lot of people have since either tried to quit their jobs and get into the VR industry, or have quit their jobs and gotten into the VR industry, or they just quit their jobs. <laughs> so I'm not saying quit your job, but some people it does inspire a lot of passion because of the endless possibilities. Anything you can imagine, it could probably be done, but there might be no infrastructure yet <laughs> for it to happen. But every day the people I'm working with are doing something that's never been done before. And as an artist, that is a wonderful place to be and it's a wonderful time to be alive. So if you came up with an idea, if you really liked, I'm just gonna make something up, unicorns, and you wanted to make a land of unicorns, <laughs> and you want people to jump on any unicorn and run around in circles, and then a butterfly comes down and sings you a song by request. That could happen. You'd have to make it yourself, but that could happen, and you'd probably be the first person to ever do that and maybe the only person ever to do that. But it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very special time in the world right now. Some people call VR the last medium. I don't know if that's true, but people think it's the ultimate, that all you can do after that is to just make VR better and better until it feels like real life. And there's also augmented reality, I'll talk about that a little bit. So uh, there are some internet things, weird things happening, so mostly I'm just gonna share pictures and videos I have already downloaded. But I'm gonna show you some clips. Obviously I can't show you VR on a screen, but I I'm gonna just give you an idea of how you can tell a 360 video story, which is kind of the beginning, the gateway to an interactive VR experience. And, and that's what I've been doing in the last six, seven months or so. It might be hard to see. So that's just a short clip. This is um, a zombie comedy I'm making. So somebody just shot this zombie and he blew up in a puff of smoke. So as you can see, you can see everything in that picture. If you saw it in VR though, it would, the, the picture would be wrapped all around your head. If you went to Scott's Google Street View tutorial, he talk, told you about how you can do that with pictures. You, you literally just take pictures in all directions. That's been around a long time. But now we're doing it with the video. So this was actually six video cameras sh shooting in all directions. I brought back some actors from a really successful web series I had directed called Boomer's Day Off. If you've ever played Left 4 Dead, it's based on that. Uh, it did very well, so that's my way of trying to get more people interested in VR, because a lot of people don't know what a 360 video is. So I decided to do a prequel of a successful web series I had, hoping to bring people back in because they want to see the old characters that they know and love. So this is the prequel story of how Oscar becomes a boomer. So this is the story of how this guy ends up becoming a zombie, which nobody ever, which I never explained in the previous series. So this goes back in time, but this time, instead of just a YouTube web series, it's a 360 video, and you're a character in the story. So you play a person who's fallen, you've, you've gotten hurt, you can't move, and Oscar's trying to come help you. He's trying to come pick you up, but he keeps getting distracted by these pesky zombies that show up. And the voice of you in this is Earl Alexander, who actually plays Lewis in the original Left 4 Dead, so we got a little link there. I'm hoping that'll get people to watch it. Um, but the way I shot this was very interesting. I shot in all directions with this camera, but if you think about it, you can't really cut. Because if you do, somebody is watching in all directions, and you will be able to watch this afterwards. I have a, a couple of Gear VRs you can watch it on later. If you think about it, if you're immersed in an environment, the picture's wrapped all around you, um, you're this person that's kind of stuck there. One thing we've learned, I know we don't have a lot of rules yet, in the VR world for storytelling. One thing we learned is people really don't like cuts anymore. So like the very, very basic storytelling technique that filmmakers learned very early in the film process no longer works in VR. 
which I actually think is awesome <laughs> because I la the more we differentiate, the better. Because in my experience, I'm, I'm running into a lot of people in the film industry who are just trying to make a film in 360 degrees and it doesn't lend itself well because it's immersive. And in real life, scenes don't just, you don't just get teleported to another place, do you? So if you want to get somebody really into the story, you're really going to pull them out of the story if you just suddenly cut in time or in location. So the very first thing I did is I went back to my theater days. I, was, I went to a performing arts academy in high school. And I directed it and rehearsed it like a play. So I, I wrote just one long scene that was three minutes long. And I got all my old actors from my old show. And we spent a full day in this comic book shop um, what is this place called? Galaxy of Comics in Van Nuys in Los Angeles, if you ever are in the area, they're really nice guys. We rehearsed there for like a full night, and the actors weren't used to that, because that's not something you usually spend a lot of time on in film. But I said, Prom I promise you this is the way to go. I just, I have a feeling. And then it was a lot of setup, but then once we went, we ran that camera, we only did three takes. And we were done. And the actors said, is that it? Are we done? And I said, yep, that's it. Because we rehearsed it. So there's number two. Something else I learned in VR storytelling, or at least in 360 video, a lot of the, the production workflow is, this, is the same in terms of what you do, but the timing changes. So you spend a lot more time in pre-production. You need to be very well rehearsed. All the actors need to know their lines perfectly and their blocking perfectly. But then the production part can go, will go really fast. As long as the, DP, the cinematographer is prepared and we're not, you're not having any problems with that, then that part can go really fast. Then the post-production, I'm still in post-production and I shot this in October. So that's just an idea. It, it, it's been a lot of work, but only because I'm a perfectionist. I'm trying to do things like spatial sound, which is something mostly only used for major motion pictures with like 5.1 surround. This is even more than that. This is like above you and below you. So I'm learning a program called Unity, which is used to make games. And I've been teaching myself that so I can make 3D sound. And the reason is, if you're watching something in real life, when you turn your head this way and that, the sound is going to change. E even as I speak, if you were to turn your head this way and that, or you were to look in another direction, the sound is going to change. And if it doesn't change, that's going to get really, it's going to break the immersion and it's going to get really confusing. Because if somebody, if you're watching an experience and somebody says, hey, look over here, not that they should say that, but they say, hey, how you doing? And they're behind you, you're not going to know that unless the sound reflects that. So just like in film where sound is important, it's probably even more important, if, poss if that's even possible, now in VR storytelling. I would say 3D sound is extremely important and it's difficult, so a lot of people are not ready to jump into it yet. This is my first time dealing with it, but it is extremely important for immersion, which is an important aspect of storytelling. If people don't feel immersed in your story, then your story won't be effective. So that, that's just something to keep in mind. I can see if I have a picture of the camera, but I can show you the process by showing you a bunch of photographs. I can't see where my mouse is. Oh, there it is. Hopefully these open in the other window. I don't know if they will. Let me do this. So instead of showing you six different video feeds, which is going to go crazy, I'm just going to show you six different photographs that represent each video. Of course, it opened in the other window. Why wouldn't it? Oh, great. So these pictures represent each video camera that I had to use. So I know it looks weird because you're just seeing the side of somebody, but that's because that just re represents one camera. So I'm shooting 60 frames a second. I believe it's like 1440 by 14, 
40-ish. Swear. With a six camera GoPro rig. I should have brought it, but um, I was in a hurry to leave. Sorry about that, but. If you see, these are, this is just like if you've ever tried to stitch a, a spherical picture together, except we're doing it with video. That adds a lot more complication, because if you think about it, people are moving across the screen, that makes it a lot more difficult. That table was the bane of my existence for a couple days. But those are the, all the images. So I stitched these videos together with a program called Color Auto Pano. You can also use something called Vit Stitch. And that's about it. There's another one called PT GUI, and that's it. And they're all expensive. Except PT GUI, that's cheaper. You're just going to have to kind of play around with it because it's spitting them out as individual images. But it's a lot cheaper. Yes? So this is 360 by 360 vertical as well as horizontal. It's 360 by 180. By 180. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And there, there are ways to film where you, you might have like a spot somewhere. Like for live, that might work because you need a place to funnel your cables through yeah. in order to live stream. But in my experience, and, and that's where it's important, because I know a lot of VR film, people who want to be feel, VR filmmakers, but they don't consume a lot of VR, and they don't play games, and they don't try things. It, it's really important to be a consumer as well as a storyteller, because that's the only way you're going to know what you don't like. And I hate any spots anywhere, because it reminds me that this isn't real. So. In my opinion, just don't be lazy. Just get the full picture if you can, if you can. If you can't, a lot of people use, just do a trick and they use Photoshop and they just comp it in. So, they, so you'll, if you're on a VR set or a 360 set, you'll see people always take a picture of the floor where the tripod was at and then they just literally just Photoshop the floor back into that spot. So it's a, it's a popular trick so you don't see the tripod. I can sh and then I'll show you just a few little clips from other things that I did. So that was a rig I have that's six cameras. Here's a rig I have that's two cameras. This is the new Kodak SP360 4K. Don't mind my, the weird look on my face. So that's one, it's only two cameras, but with an extremely wide fisheye lens. So even though it's only two going back to back, the wide lenses allow for overlap. As long as the two pictures overlap, you can stitch the picture into a sphere uh, without any kind of aberrations somewhat. I mean, we're kind of warping reality here, pretending it's all being seen from one point of view. But if you think about it, you're defying physics because that doesn't exist. So whether you're filming from two cameras or six, You'll still need software like Color Auto Pano to manually stitch the pictures together, and you will have to warp somewhat because it th because of parallax, things just will not all connect. So you may get two images and stitch them right here to get it perfect, but by doing that, you've screwed up the screen. So now you've got to go and fix the screen. It's a really crazy process right now, but it, that's early adoption for you. Hopefully, it will improve. And I'll get to that because the globe problem. I already think this process could use a lot of improvement, and I am working on that. So you'll hear me say a lot of things you will not hear some people say in the industry because they want to make money on their cameras. But don't listen to them. Yes? I was just going to ask, I know that they, you can do it in After Effects, but it's not as nice. So they can experiment maybe. Could we do that? Yeah, I know somebody who's done it in After Effects. He said it was really hard, but now that some time has gone by, it's possible maybe there's a plugin you could buy. There's a tutorial on YouTube. There's a tutorial, okay. So maybe that could be better for you. Um, AutoPano is designed specifically for stitching, though, so there's a lot of... like early. A lot of things that... There's a lot of things I could go into that I won't, that you'll just discover as you try to do 360 video. But these are two images back-to-back. And then I just stitched them together into one video. Can you even see this okay, or is it too dark, bright out? 
So this was at Daz 3D down in downtown. They, they make, uh, you can use their software or Morph 3D to create model, 3D models. And they've been really wonderful sponsors of VR related events. So that's one side, that's Berkeley from Daz 3D. And then that's me on the other side setting up the cameras. I clap my hands, that's the most common way to stitch video. It's not, it, it's not actually exactly for sound sync. It, it's actually a way for color auto pano to sync the movements together. That's another thing that would be difficult if you did it with After Effects. Um, but you have to know what you're it, doing. It's something you don't think about offhand, but if you think about it, if everybody's moving around, if they're off by even a millisecond, the whole stitch will, won't work because the per people as they walk are gonna get all screwed up because they are literally like existing in time in, in, out of things. So I prefer this setup. It just came out in mid-January. It's the Kodak SP360 dual mount 4K. So, you know, just memorize that. Um, <laughs> no, if you look up 4K, like 360 cameras yeah, for right. Kodak, you'll find it. That was actually the first rig I ever had was the, the original, which only goes down to 2K. Awesome. No just unplugged it. I can't tighten this, so the thing keeps coming loose. Ah, makes sense. Yeah, but we're fixing it. Yeah, I try to screw it, but it doesn't go in. Technical difficulties. Can you help me? This I can keep going. I'll go help. So I can show you what that ends up. It, it's because yeah, I'm loosening this screw. It doesn't actually do anything. Mm. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so once I had those two videos, I went ahead and stitched them together. And it's much easier with two cameras instead of six cameras. That's all I'm gonna say. But you lose a little resolution. This is close to 4K. But if you think about it right now, 4K is enough because that's all that YouTube supports for now. But, but, Google, but Google is really big. It came off again. Maybe you just have to hold it. But Google's getting behind VR, so you will see more and more support for 360 video. Thank you. So I'm in the YouTube Space LA program, as I had mentioned before, and I just got an email today, actually, uh, inviting me to a Sundance Institute VR symposium with their new 360 programming director, who is somebody I know who used to do something else at YouTube Space. But I was really happy to hear that, because that means YouTube is really getting on board. I know Google's getting on board with VR, but YouTube space is kind of its own thing. And so I was really happy to hear that they're working on trying to encourage content creators to make 360 content. They, recent, they recently, maybe sometime last year, started supporting, in, a, in addition to 360 video, 3D 360 video which is extremely complicated, I'm not gonna go there unless you have minimum $500,000 budget. And the next thing they're working on is uh, the cardboard, and hopefully soon, YouTube, uh, are supporting 360 sound as well. So all the tech companies are getting on board. If you have a story that you wanna tell, I would encourage you to consider telling it in a, some kind of 360 or VR environment. It's not completely mainstream yet, but it will be very soon. All of the major headsets are coming out late this month or early next month. And, you know, even if it doesn't catch fire right away, it is the future and a lot of money is going into it. Facebook is behind it with Oculus, HTC with the Vive, PlayStation with their PSVR, but everybody needs content. And there's only so much Hollywood content you're gonna get, and that's all just like an advertisement. People really want stories. So I helped at this film festival, the Kaleidoscope VR Film Festival, which was playing all around America. They were so successful, now they're playing around the world. And it was very educational, because I'm giving demos, I talk to audiences, and they don't care about the things that are technically inspiring. They want stories, and there weren't enough stories. So we need more storytellers involved. Don't let the technical part um, intimidate you. I figured it out and I only started doing this in June and I 
I've met with a lot of success. I've had paid gigs, I've gotten invited to speak at places, I've been on, I don't know what those are, like live stream interview thingies, panels. <laughs> um, because there's not a lot of people doing it yet. So people are really curious about it and want to know what it is and they want to know how they can get involved. So if you have more questions, you can ask me or there's a really wonderful group on Facebook called the VR360 Professionals Facebook group. I highly recommend it. it that's how I learned a lot, because there was nothing. Nothing existed at the time. The color auto panel forums sucked and they still suck. So when I had a question, I just went on there, it was like the Wild West, and I just asked and asked until somebody somewhere had tr tried what I was trying to do and they, they helped me figure it out. So it's a little confusing, but it can be done. In terms of money, you could just get like a theta, which I think a few hundred bucks, and start doing stuff right now. Yeah, the quality is not great, but it reminds me of, I'll probably be dating myself here, reminds me of the 90s with Dogma 95, which Lars von Trier and some friends sought out to prove a good story doesn't need to be technically impressive. And so they, they had all these rules. You couldn't, ha it, you couldn't have artificial lighting. And they just used digital cameras. And they were wildly successful because they had compelling actors and stories and good writing. And it really proved something to the world that you don't need these crazy Hollywood budgets. We have this instinctive need to consume stories. It's actually like, there are scientific studies on why this is, but it's how we expand our experiences. That's how we survive. That's how we know if you go across the mountain, the polar bear is gonna kill you because some guy came back to the village and said, my friend got eaten by the polar bear. <laughs> and that's the story. And that's why we love stories because it expands our experience and VR is gonna be doing that a thousand fold. So you have the opportunity to give people experiences my, my example of, you know, that was just me at a VR meetup. I have that other one where it's a zombie, a zombie comedy. I have a much more serious one. I can, if I can find it, I can show you a really short clip. That's much more intense. It's like a sci-fi mystery drama where you're jumping from body to body. This is my attempt to be more interactive. But those are the things that are important to me. I like sci-fi. I like virtual reality. You know, the, it plays with the concepts of memory. But I don't know what's important to you. Whatever is important to you, it doesn't even have to be a story. If you're just a doctor or an architect, it's really exciting to see people think, how, how can VR help my industry? And then see people actually act on it and start coming up with apps, experiences, tools, stories that can help them communicate in some way by telling a story, by sharing an experience to educate other people or to entertain. It doesn't matter what it is that you want to get out of it you can give somebody an experience that you probably couldn't have done any other way. So a basic example is I made a very simple music video, very simple, but I, my experiment was with compositing. So I put picture in picture all around the sphere so that you could see other YouTubers. Um, there was a machinima telling a story, there was motion graphic lyrics, there was another YouTuber who sang with me, and then another YouTuber did the music, they did, they played piano, and then I'm just in the room singing. Really simple. And people are, so most people are like, oh, that's neat. But then one game dev tried it at a meetup, and he cried. <laughs> I was like, what? That? Like, I always wanted to make people cry, but that's not what I expected. But he just really liked the singing, and he just felt like he was in a room with somebody, and they were singing to him. And he's like the only one in the room, and somebody was singing to him, and he likes music, and it was just really nice. And he, he got teary-eyed because he forgot there were people there with him, then that people were watching him. And he got embarrassed afterwards, but I, I thanked him and I said, no, that's, that's awesome. And I said, that's why, why I do it. So, you know, my examples are very specific to what I, stories I like to tell, but I will say there's a lot of opportunities right now, guys. It'll take a lot of hard work, but if you join some of these Facebook groups, you start doing some research, uh, you invest at least a few hundred bucks if you have it, or you just borrow a camera. That's what I did when I was a kid. <laughs> I borrowed a lot of things, or from my school, and I figured it out. And there's a, there's a lot going on right now. People really need content creators, so I, I highly recommend you guys take it seriously. Think about joining the crusade. <laughs>
Go ahead. You say content creators. Is there a uniform format that people are creating VR in? And if so, like, what does that format look like? Do you submit your, your content as a video that's, you know, 180 pixels tall by such wide and they're able to just compress that into their VR format or how does that work? That's a great question. So the question was, if you create content, is there any uniform format that you do it in? The answer is not really. Lovely. <laughs> but thankfully, because a lot of these platforms are run by tech companies, they are very specific. So they'll let you know what their parameters are, but they will be different for every platform. Makes sense. So for instance, on YouTube, you submit a 4096 by 2048 2 by 1 video 40, 40 by one. Okay. with metadata, 360 metadata injected. That sounds complicated, but it's really not. Uh -huh. uh, and that's what they take. But if you were to submit to Milk VR, which is a really pop, the most popular way to watch videos on the Gear VR, that's different. They're going to have different requirements. And they prefer if you don't move the camera, they prefer if you use 3D sound. But from what I've seen, they'll, they'll still accept it, but there's like a two-month waiting list to get into the queue because everybody's sending in really crappy videos that they have to review. Um, but it's kind of like an honor to get accepted. They don't accept everything. Makes sense. Um, there's Bridio, which is one of my favorites because they're just really nice people, and, and they do just 360 videos online. There's Little Star, who is sponsoring some series now. There's a lot of money out there, too, by the way, guys. There was like a $10,000... Um, Milk VR contest recently to do like a 30 second video of your favorite location in the world or something like that. So, and then Little Star's doing something I can't remember. So it's a good time to get in the game if you're interested. Um, All of my I want to show some of my sci-fi thing, but I'm not sure if I have a clip of it. Let me see. Oh, I have, you know what I have is a it's kind of meta. I have a 360 clip of behind the scenes of making my 360 project. So you can see the set. I shot this at YouTube Space LA. And I'll show you how it's, it shows up as a rectangle. And that's because that's how YouTube... That two-to-one format. Yeah, it's that two-to-one format that YouTube has requested. It's called equirectangular. So it's, it's rectangular, but if you use this little app, called 360 Metadata Injector that YouTube gives you for free. It's really easy. All you do is open it, take your video, save it, and now it's got metadata saying, hey, this is a 360 video. Once you do that, when you upload it, YouTube knows it's a 360 video, and it knows to wrap the video back around. Let's see. Where did it go? I am intrigued. I'm just going to sing a song. Bro, I'm like scared I'm going to do something stupid when I get home. Where'd it go? I just had it. Oh, you know what? I had it on YouTube, that's why. So, um, you may or may not know this, but Facebook also supports 360 video now. I'm sorry? They do 360 audio now? Oh, awesome. Okay. And they just incorporated with the Gear VR. Could you show the Gear VR wall? Could you grab one? So the Gear VR is this like $99 attachment you can put on your Samsung Galaxy or Note 4. Google's getting in the game. They're going to be doing it too. Hi, Scott. Google guy. Um, so they're integrating more Facebook now. So now you can log into Facebook from Gear VR. So if you, it, it, that's also a good way to promote your 360 videos if you start making any, is uh, you can try to get into their library, their feature library. Thank you for modeling, Will. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that has a headset in it, that device for you? Yeah, so that's just a phone that goes onto a $99 attachment. This looks a little different because mine and Will's are from older days. <laughs> We're veterans of like a whole year ago. So it looked, this is the old prototype that was a little more expensive. You, you look like Vanna White. Let's see. Um, yeah, so you attach your headphones. You can play it off the phone, but you can also just attach regular headphones or regular earbuds and you'll hear it, and if there's spatial sound, it, it will do spatial sound, so it'll react to what you do. 
if the content was created that way. That's crazy. So I'll just pull it up here. I had it in a window, but all the windows got messed up when I opened a second display for the projector. But I'll show you my, actually I can show you my channel. So I have two channels. My main channel is called Kill9TV. It's a Unix command to shut, complete a shutdown program. So the idea is to shut down your TV and step out into the metaverse and make more compelling content. Be a creator, not just a consumer, and break out of that four-walled box. Or I really like that picture frame. So I'm going to show you this. I don't remember if it's unlisted or not, but I'll show it to you. This is a 360 video of my shoot for a sci-fi project that is it's a pilot. So people will probably never see this. I think only like 20 people, 20, 30 people have ever seen this. I, I just show it to them at demos because I'm trying to get funding to shoot it for realsies with 3D and everything, which is very complicated. Let me just take that tab because there's a lot of tabs. So this isn't the actual project. This is me on the set shooting the project. This was exciting because I had my, the hardest time I was having was that I had to be an instructor and a director, even with my regular crew, because nobody understood how 360 video worked. So the second time I shot a 360 narrative, uh, what I did is I went ahead and asked for help. So I went on the 360 Facebook group, 360 VR Facebook group, and said, who else is shooting stuff in LA? I'm shooting at YouTube Space. Who wants to see YouTube Space? And I got like 15 people to, you know, to volunteer a lot. Only like 10 showed up. But I went from people who knew nothing about 360 to people who knew everything about 360. So it was, like, it was awesome because they helped me shoot this, but it was actually kind of hard too because there are no rules, and so we were fight, we were arguing. Normally the director, what they say is, you know, that what they say goes, but I said, we're all figuring this out, so let's feel free to tell me if you think something's a bad idea or tell me if you catch something that I missed because it's really hard to direct in 360 directions. You're constantly missing things. So people would say, oh, that chair was out of place or, oh, she blinked weird. That's not really what they really said. It's just an example. But, you know, they'd say she blinked weird when you weren't looking and, and there was just, you need like five continuity people. It's kind of crazy. So I have a feeling as time goes by, roles are gonna change, but we're, we're still figuring that out. But you might need multiple um, scripty people, like content, uh, sorry, continuity people. Yeah, yeah, scripties is what that is. So, um, and that, that might be, e even um, they're working on technology, it exists but it's very expensive where the director can look in an actual HMD. But even then, you're still missing out on everything that's going on, so you gotta watch it like 30 times. So I, I left, it was a little bit by committee, which I'd never done before, but this was kind of a fun experiment. YouTube space let us use the set all day, didn't cost us anything, so I'm like, hey, let's just do an experiment. But we would fight. Because, about things, because there are no rules. And when there are no rules, you don't know whether you should break them or not. So we had all sorts of bizarre arguments. He shouldn't walk over there, or, or oh no, I'd argue with the DP a lot, because he would say, just have him walk over here, because we're stitching the video right here, and he can't, he can't go over here. And then I would argue, yeah, but it doesn't make sense for him to be here. It does it, like in the, in the story, it doesn't make sense. And in the end, for me, the story is more important than anything. I don't care what the technical is. We gotta make it work for the story, because if the story doesn't work, nobody's gonna care about the stitch lines, because they are already, they've already lost interest. So there were a lot of arguments like that. Balancing the technical limitations versus how to tell an immersive story that's not gonna break the reality for people. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I think that, I think that should be its own. Okay. Itself. Yeah. 
Yeah, don't worry about him. I mean, you this. do pay attention to her. So I, um, I'm mostly we'll trying to get the pacing. Kind of yeah, I think if you, if you walk up while she's saying it, so that you are waiting for the turn. And I want just to make sure this is right. My eye lines are. So we have to paint the ceiling in afterwards here. This is what Where's that? Just so you can see the full. How many cameras? What, what? Which rig did you shoot this one on? Doctor Clark was an accomplished. It's just a really quick behind the scenes. It's not the actual project. So this was. It's interesting, this behind the scenes was shot with a, I believe it was a 360 Heroes, six cameras, yeah. maybe it was seven cameras uh, system, but I shot with an iZuger four camera system with wide angle lenses. And that wasn't mine, that was my cinematographer's. His name is Fabian, he made a, something called Make 360. It's a open source book that's trying to help people learn how to make 360 videos. So you can check him out. Yeah, I, did, I was in such a hurry to get here because I didn't know I was speaking. So, uh, so these are the originals. I didn't bring mine. These are the original. Thank you. These are the original Kodak SP360s. So these shoot 1080, and put together they can make a 10K image back to back. So when I in June, when I was very inspired and I was like, I don't know how this works, but I'll figure it out. Uh, I I saw a video um, online from Kodak in just saying, here's a 360 video we made by putting two of these together. It's really casual, not a lot of people saw the video. But when I saw it, I thought, that's it, that's how I'm gonna do it. So I ordered two of these, didn't know what to do, I found like two videos of people screwing around with it on YouTube. It's like a really small community of kind of like DIY people. And I literally just like Velcroed them together with like industrial tape. Like, and since then, like you can do it with mounts. But like for a while, I was just walking around with these like Velcroed together cameras and it was like super janky, but at the Boston VR meetup, they're like, you should do demos, tell us how you did it. And that's when I realized, even though it was super janky, there weren't a lot of people doing this, and more people wanted to learn about how to do it. So I ended up spending, this is my second demo, like a, a month, or my second meetup. This is a month after I had that inspirational first time with VR, and by the second time, I'm doing a demo of something I barely understand what I'm doing. Um, but since then, I, I've figured it. Nobody's really figured it out, but I've, I've learned more. So then I moved up to my six camera Freedom 360. That's what I shot that zombie comedy with. Then uh, these behind the scenes are shot with the um, 360 Heroes. I believe it's the 360 Heroes rig. I shot with the Izuka rig. So you got a lot of choices here, guys. Uh, and they're all mostly GoPros or, or Kodak SP360s. It's just a rig you put together. They even sell ones on eBay that are 3D printed that are a lot cheaper. Just be careful with those, because I. You know, the, I, I know somebody got burned on one of those and it, it didn't stitch together as well. Um, and then, I was just gonna and then now I have one that looks just, just like this, but they're black. The printer, and so. they're the Kodak 4Ks, so that together, and it's kind of weird, but yeah. together they make a 4K image or I can, I've got a all in 360. That, which still actually doesn't look Wood, yeah. perfect, but for it's most part. because of bandwidth issues with the internet, that's really like the max you're gonna be doing for the most part. But my Freedom 360 rig with six cameras can actually shoot almost 6K. There's just like not much I can do with that right now because of bandwidth in terms of showing it online. Now that I've said all that, I mean, how small? I'm gonna tell you that Certain people in the industry say 360 video is not even VR, and it's all it's a bunch of bull honking. And my filmmaker friends hate it because I actually agree with him. Uh, and filmmakers don't like that because they like to say, oh, I'm a VR so pioneer. Uh, but actually, no, it's just a picture that's all around you. <laughs> it's like it, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, so the lack of interactivity kind of changes it. John Carmack, um, who is at Oculus now, said in a presentation, okay, it's not like fully VR, because you can't like walk around in it yet, but we'll get there. Um, but, it, one, it's a gateway to VR, 
a lot of non-gamers are gonna get into VR thanks to passive content that's more like a movie for people who really don't care about games. And that's important to make something mainstream. Also, it's a little short-sighted because, yeah, right now it's super janky, but it's gonna get there. And there's going to be, I believe, a new storytelling format that we don't have a name for yet that's not quite a game and not quite a film, but it's a somewhat interactive, immersive experience. Because sometimes you want to watch a movie and sometimes you want to watch a game, you don't always want to interact with your movies. Sometimes you just want to get lost. And I feel like that's the purpose of 360 videos right now. Like I, I have family members who I thought would have no interest in VR, but they loved 360 videos. So there is a future, but having said that, I really hate the process right now. The stitching is, is very time consuming, and there are some companies that have a lot of investment that are promising that they're gonna be able to auto stitch for you, but everything I've seen, it doesn't look that good. So if you really look carefully at these like CES demos, stitching doesn't look good. Uh, and so that's gonna break the reality or the immersion for people if they're watching, if you're trying to tell a story with these. So unfortunately for now, I'm still sitting there just, you know, stitching these videos like I, I feel like a grandma like making a quilt or something. It's just, it's, it's frustrating as a storyteller because I just want to tell stories. But that's what happens when you're an early adopter. Like sometimes, you know, them's the breaks. But there are two new technologies that are coming. One is called photogrammetry and one is called light fields. And I can't go into them too much, but I will leave, uh, those are the future. And that's how we're really gonna be able to tell live action stories. Most VR is, for, especially if it's a game, it's gonna be CG. But there's only so much you can do with CG in terms of empathy, which is one of the strongest emotions you can pull from somebody with an immersive experience. And that's why live action, I think, will always be important. And so photogrammetry and light fields is gonna get us there. So everything I've been explaining is a camera like these, and it's called inside out technology. So you're on the inside and you're filming out. You're filming out in your environment, but you can't do anything but look around. You can't walk around in it. Well, there's something called photogrammetry and eventually light fields with the concept that it's outside in. There will be many cameras. If you ever saw the making of the matrix, it's the same concept. It's a similar concept except instead of a still. It's moving, so you'll have an array of cameras, and you'll capture a person or an event, and then um, there, it's hard to explain in a very simplified way, but basically through an algorithm, you can figure out how that, thing, that item would have looked, even where there is no camera, be, just because of the relation of the cameras that do exist. And so it's able to make a full 3D model of a human being or an animal or a tree or whatever you're, you filmed, but it's a 3D model and you can place it in a CG environment. And I think that that is the next step and that's where I'm going next. So as soon as I finish these projects, I'm kind of just so over the 360. I mean, I'll, I'll do it once in a while for clients, but for as a storyteller, that's already what I'm doing. So there's a company called 8i. Um, I can probably pull up their website if I can read this. 8i and organic motion are the only ones I know of who are doing this. I mean, this is bleeding cutting edge here. But they are basically putting their money in that camp, and so am I. And the reason is, there's only so much I wanna do just watching, even if it's passive and I'm not interacting a lot with my environment. Being able to move around is really important if you wanna feel like something's real. So this act, that model you see there was filmed with an array of cameras and was 3D scanned in live action and then placed in a CG environment. So remember I said that table and how I really hated that table? It's because I'm trying to stitch these videos together and I'm trying to get this table to look real and it's all messed up. And that's when I realized, like, I'm a storyteller. Why am I sitting here stitching this table for three hours? <laughs> this is like, not what I want to be doing with my time. And that's when I realized that same lesson that you, we learned from Dogma 95. In my theory, this is my theory, I need, I, mean, I need to prove it. If you can have great actors who are real, 
it's okay if the environment is CG and people and an audience will forgive it because it's more important that the actor has real expressions and is really saying and going through the emotions that they're going through. And I actually learned the same lesson myself on YouTube, and I tell this story even though it's not a VR story. I, the, the very, I was always obsessed with production value because I started in film school, but my first series that went viral on YouTube didn't even have very good production value. Uh, just because th there was an emergency, the makeup uh, and a special effects person canceled at the last minute, like the night before. So I had no makeup. We're trying to like put together costume makeup to make zombies. We had to create this like vomiting effect, uh, like with Home Depot stuff at three in the morning. So it was, we were three hours behind, so like the lighting doesn't match. And to me, it was like the most horrible disaster. <laughs> but the actors were very good. We had a good rapport because we had worked together before. I had just taken a really good directing workshop uh, in LA. So I was practicing these new tools to make the performance more authentic, even, even when it's comedy. An authentic performance will lend itself to just a better story and experience overall. And that's what went viral. And, and, I, and nobody cared. Nobody cared that the makeup was crap. It wasn't until two years later that anybody pointed out the lighting discrepancy in two shots. And that really taught me that Dogma 95 lesson, that if you, have a, if you have just a compelling story and compelling actors, people will forgive a lot. As long as the technology isn't distracting, like really bad audio or really dark lighting. So I'm sharing with you my theory. I'll be trying to prove it in the next year. So you can, you'll find out, I guess, if this works or not. But my theory is, I'm putting my money in, the, in this, on this horse. I'm talking to Adai, and um, I'm going to be pitching them that sci-fi project that you saw me shoot at YouTube Space LA. That was just a proof of concept. So I'm gonna be pitching it to them, and they seem to be uh, excited about me shooting something because they want content creators, not just technical demos. They want to try to start telling stories. And we will see if we get good actors and good writing Will people forgive a CG environment all around them? Because I would love to stop stitching tables and start focusing on what I was meant to do, which is to direct actors and to create moving experiences. So I'm putting my money on this new technology. And if this doesn't work, in a couple years, light fields will be around. And hopefully, maybe that will fix things. Uh, that, that's just um, basically bouncing off the light from a center space. It's still inside out, so I'm not sure how I feel about it, but that would also let you walk around in the environment. And this would let you walk around in the environment in, uh, three, in virtual reality. Are there any questions about this? I know it's kind of intense. So, it, I don't know if it's exactly the same. I was just talking to somebody about that who was working at ILM for a long time, but now he, he left. But he, he, cause he, he was using that technology to film something. It was, it was pretty cool. I don't know if it would work in the 360 VR environment, but I think it would be something similar. It, it would be a similar technology. Mm -hmm. But then he was pointing the camera wherever he was pointed, and they were able to animate that into a scene. Okay, so it sounds like it's almost that's almost like augmented reality. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of the next generation. Stuff yeah. Watching that, how that was done, and then they were able to do the motion capture stuff within that. So he was he would like grab the camera and he would film. I've the seen that. that yeah, ILM was, was doing something like that. Be able to go around him, and then that wall, that air floor or whatever, was around him. Okay. And they were able to use that reference. So that that's the. That's probably something ILM's working on. They had a really great presentation at New Frontier with some stuff like that that they're working on. Everybody's kind of just trying different things. One thing I'm excited about is I was just at Facebook trying Oculus Medium, and I was sculpting 3D objects with my hands, and that was like incredibly exciting. Oh, I wish I could show you. Um, 
if you follow me on Twitter, Michelle Kenobi, I'll, I'll, I keep forgetting to post it. I have some stills of something I created, a little guy named Seymour. And I spent like 20 minutes making him, but I, I, th there's gonna be more tools for people to just make things in a more organic fashion in VR itself, which is extremely exciting for me as somebody who started by working with my hands as, as an illustrator at, at a young age. There was this weird gap for me. I never learned how to draw digitally. I just, it just felt weird. And I just kind of jumped over to theater and then I jumped over to film. But that's changing. And now um, a lot of like a Unity and Unreal Engine are coming out with tools so that you can start working on your 3D environments and your models with your hands, with your controller. So when I made Seymour, I literally am using my hands and I blow them up like a ball and I give them, eye I'm doing this, giving him eyeballs and eyebrows and I actually kind of hold them like a baby with one controller and I'm like kind of holding him while I'm working on him. And it was, it was amazing, like the presence is like a big word you'll hear. It was amazing the presence I felt. Like he felt like a real thing. I, like I made this thing and he kind of came alive to me to the point where I was kind of sad when he was gone because <laughs> they, they couldn't save him. Uh, we're, I gotta finish up, but I'm gonna show you some, just something really quick with augmented reality so you can see. It's very, I think it's gonna be very similar except it can be, related to whatever environment you're in. But I, I had a really great live stream on Periscope with the guys from Meta. So they're like a HoloLens competitor. HoloLens is what Microsoft is coming out with for augmented reality. But the idea is you have clear glasses and then 3D models pop up all around you. And if you think about it, the implication, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless for that. Surgeons can use it in surgery. Uh, but let me just show you the video and you'll, you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. It's very short, it's 38 seconds, but I, I like showing people this because uh, a, AR is going to be a way to tell stories too. And it's, a, and it's a similar technology that you use. There it is. Jace Hansen. Jace is responsible for the holograms inside of the uh, Iron Man movie, Avengers, and the Star Wars movie. He's on our UI UX team. And what you're seeing right now is a holographic display right in front of you with his work on Yes, it's the Iron Man. So now you're seeing the Earth, 2.5K. So take a step back, walk around to the side, you can view it all of its glory. Uh, start going crazy with your fingers, your index fingers. Start going ah! <laughs> oh my god, it exploded. So you come around to the profile view of the screen. Come to the side, one side, you can come to this side if you want. And the other reason they invest is because our screens are way thinner than theirs. And now what you're seeing is the whole human anatomy to your right. So look up close at that. Put your head in the rib cage if you want to. This is your reward for tuning in, guys. Let's see if I can. You think you can get it? Let's see. Ryan, you have a better uh, experience with doing this. Where's the camera? Okay. Here it is. Yep. Can you guys see that? That's the view straight from inside. So that's a piece of glass that you're looking at, just with the, the Paris, my, my camera, my phone camera, where we were live periscoping. So all of those items were placed in the real world. So I'm still, I can still see everything in the room, but I'm seeing a globe, I'm seeing a body, uh, like a, it's like a physiology kind of um, tutorial, and I can pull out, the, you know, different, I can see the nervous system, I can pull out the skeleton. The possibilities are endless for AR. I'm just kind of looking into how I can tell stories that way, but uh, I think geocaching type or, or you know anything geographically related is probably going to be one of the tourism is probably going to be one of the biggest things I'm imagining. You go visit Boston and you turn something on and Paul Revere pops up and starts riding down the street. So um, I don't know how to make that not cheesy, but I think that that's going to be another really exciting way to tell stories. But that's not what today is about. Today's about VR. If you want to learn more, you can go to michelleosorio.com and contact me through any of my social media, and I would be happy to answer your questions about my experiences so far experimenting with virtual reality storytelling. Any questions? All right. I'm sorry? Sorry, it's just, I mean, but the main thing now is content. I mean, oh, Joey. Content is king. Oh, Joey. There's just not enough content. The, most of the content now is advertising. So
So like The Martian, the movie, had a Martian experience. Minnie Cooper did a really nice 360 video that costs like $2 million-ish. So I mean, that stuff's expensive, but I'm trying to like help with the, the shoestring indie budget kind of so movement. So contact you with a script or something like that, you'd be able to do this on the market. Yeah, yeah, you can talk to me. I have like three rigs and you know, maybe I can lend you one or rent one or just depends on if it's a good project or not. Sure. So yeah, con feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, so my talk is done at Salt Lake Community College, and now I am showing people my work. So, they're watching the See You Again music video, which uses Machinima from Sims, uh, from Quill Sims, and has some other collaboration that I learned how to composite using uh, Metal Skybox Studio in After Effects. And uh, there was a collaboration with some other awesome simmers and motion graphics people and musicians. So it's a, it's a good, soft introduction to somebody who hasn't used VR before or hasn't watched a 360 video before. And then I'll show my zombie comedy work in progress, Boomer's Day Off Zero, after this. Here's Will, co-founder of Utah VR Meetup Group that I've been helping while I'm in town for a project. He's also demoing content. And there's Scott, who makes a Google Street View 360 pictures. <laughs>